8.55 Eastern Time, and Columbia and its affiliated stations bring you Elmer Davis and the news. The Emperor of Japan today appointed General Abe, the former Prime Minister, who is special ambassador to the new government the Japanese had set up in China, as his personal representative with supreme authority over the Japanese military and naval forces in the occupied area. And, of course, in fact, if not in theory, supreme authority over Wang Qingwei's government as well. Dispatches from Tokyo say that this means that the period of army control in China has ended and that irresponsible treatment both of Chinese and foreigners will be ended too. But it also means that the prestige of the imperial throne has been put behind the policy of establishing the new order in East Asia, including the dummy government in China. And thus, according to Japanese constitutional and religious theory, that policy is irreversible and cannot be allowed to fail. Forecasts of the Japanese program say that northern China and inner Mongolia, nominally under control of Wang Qingwei, will actually be governed by Japanese or their Chinese agents, and that in central China, Wang will have, as the dispatches put it, virtually complete independence so long as he cooperates with Japan. Military operations against the real Chinese government are to be continued, and it's admitted in Tokyo that it may be many years before Chinese resistance is broken. But in the meantime, a vigorous effort is to be made to conciliate foreign powers in the hope that they will lend Dr. Wang's government some money. Especially, an attempt will be made to treat Americans well, in pursuance of the Japanese theory that this government and people merely misunderstand Japan's ideals. Whatever may be the success of this policy, the Japanese seem to have a good chance of making friends with the British, at least until this war is over. The recent remark of the British ambassador that Japan and Britain were ultimately striving for the same objective was underlined today by the London Times, which often served as a mouthpiece for the British government in the old appeasement days. Now it describes the Japanese invasion of China and the attempt to set up a phony government in the occupied areas as Japan's great experiment. However, there must be men in Japan who suspect that this form of appeasement may not last long if England wins the war. Meanwhile, a British spokesman said that the Allies had no intention of attempting to land troops in Scandinavia or to police Scandinavian waters. So apparently the London and Paris governments have realized the unwisdom of aggression against neutral Norway to cut off the shipments of iron ore, which within a few weeks, Germany will be able to get direct from Sweden through the safe waters of the Baltic. The Germans threaten countermeasures if the British interfere with their trade through Norwegian waters, but it would probably be found in practice that it would be easier for either country to put pressure on Norway than on the enemy. British broadcasts today had a good deal to say about the possibility of hampering Germany's overland imports from the Balkans and the Danube Valley. Offhand, it is hard to see how they could do it, but a German comment possibly gives the answer that, I quote, The British cannot hope to empty the Balkans like a bucket with panicky purchases, often of useless things, end quote. In this competition for Balkan exports, it's a safe bet that neither side is loading itself up with useless things. Our London correspondent, Mr. Morrow, spoke tonight of the combination of optimism and impatience prevalent in England, but so far it does not seem strong enough to push the government into reckless measures. Representative Hamilton Fish today introduced a resolution calling for an investigation of the German White Book charges and said that if upon investigation the facts warrant impeachment of any ambassador or even of the president, the House should act. Mr. Fish said he could not conceive that the German foreign ministry would forge or fabricate documents. His remarks were, of course, extensively quoted in Berlin. Senator Reynolds of North Carolina is worried about the movements of Mr. Sumner Wells. He said he wants to know where Mr. Wells went, with whom he talked, and what was done. The newspaper files could answer his first two questions for him, and we have no evidence so far that anything was done. Senator Wheeler of Montana, speaking today to the Commonwealth Club of San Francisco, where Mr. Roosevelt made about the only speech of his 1932 campaign that foreshadowed the New Deal, Senator Wheeler said he did not believe the president wanted or would take another nomination. Speaking for himself, Mr. Wheeler said that if the party felt he could come near winning, he would take a nomination, but that he wasn't campaigning for it and would rather be a senator than vice president. And John L. Lewis said that unless the Democrats nominated a candidate and adopted a platform satisfactory to labor, there'd be another convention. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.